All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hi, we, we have just hit uh, our participants have, have joined us. We've given them a few minutes and now it's officially kick off this virtual town hall discussion. Good morning. My name is Paco Pangalangan. I'm the executive director of Strat-based ADR Institute. And I'll be serving as, as the host for today's discussion. First of all, you know, I'd like to welcome our panelists, our panel of former cabinet members, and as well as our participants from the public and private sectors, civil society, academia, and media, uh, Strat-based to this event today. Uh, Strat-based ADR Institute in partnership with the Nino and Corey Aquino Foundation has organized this virtual town hall discussion entitled Looking Back to Build Forward Lessons from Aquino's Reforms. Uh, the commemorative forum aims to look back at the achievements and the legacy of the late president, uh, Noy Noy Aquino, to highlight key lessons as we build forward. Uh, before we move on, I just want to uh, give our participants an idea of the flow of the program. Uh, after we hear from our speakers, we'll be having a few minutes for an open forum question and answer portion, which will be moderated by uh, Strat-based ADR convener Dr. Kiko Magno. Um, but without further ado, please allow me to introduce uh, the president of Strat-based ADR Institute, Professor Victor Andres Dindo uh, to officially open today's uh, event with his opening remarks. Professor Manhit. Your audio lang po. Thank you, Papa. Sorry for that. I was still on mute. Uh, but good morning to our panelists, speakers, uh, esteemed cabinet members of uh, Aquino administration. We also would like to welcome our participants. I think we had a registration of uh, nearly 270 people uh, of this morning for this virtual town hall discussion. We thought of organizing, hosting a discussion that focuses on President Aquino's reforms that we felt, we experienced, and benefited us in Philippine society. The, the past few years, we have seen this so-called crisis of information integrity started to emerge and develop. And we have seen how disinformation and misinformation have shaped political discourse. In this context of health come societal crisis, this inescapable reality of the online world has all the more exacerbated the so-called pandemic of disinformation and misinformation that in our round table, town hall discussion uh, last July after the sauna, the fifth sauna of President Duterte, I spoke of this point that we have suffered a pandemic of disinformation. But we remain hopeful in our institute that collectively as a society with independent institution, independent media, real people in social media should realize that it's time for us to look for these types of candidates, not based on narratives or spin. And we fear what is happening in social media. With the rise of Filipinos in social media platforms like YouTube, Facebook, I think nearly 87 million of our population are known to be part of social media platforms. We have seen how it affected even traditional media, both print and online. We've seen how they have, it has affected the online or the trust rating of both online TV, radio, and print outputs of this traditional media. As we have seen it in this Oxford Reuters study that was conducted in partnership with Filipino scholars in the University of the Philippines. But what is key is that as we look at these trust ratings, as we see them affected by this pandemic of disinformation, we hope through platforms like the ADR Institute, we can look back 
to try to challenge this disinformation. And we believe that it's time to look back also to the Ang Matuwid espoused by the acting administration that we believe was able to set the appropriate political, economic, and social environment for the, for the promotion of information integrity. Here we speak of values like principled leadership and political reforms. Now we have the benefit the K-12 and the quality education, the bottom-up budgeting, the transparent Pantawid familia execution. We speak of good governance is good economics. We have seen how the outside world saw an opportunity to invest more. And as they invested more, it created job opportunities, livelihood opportunities for our people. And what a dignified foreign policy can do. We continue, our people, the public, continue to demand for government to assert more in terms of protecting our maritime and economic rights and, our, and, our, and the territorial integrity of the Philippines with regards to the West Philippine Sea. Just this morning, I published a commentary on the eve of. Uh, that anniversary of, of uh, former center, Ninoy. And here I argued that by contrasting the practices, policies, and results of the current Duterte administration with those of the Aquino administration, it could be a source of lesson that through the preservation and the promotion of a democratic way of life, a democracy with integrity and decency in government public participation, transparency, and dynamism for social and institutional reform is what we need. That's why I emphasize principal leadership, good governance, a dignified foreign policy is good economics. And under this context, I believe we should be guided as we try to look forward and build and push for true reforms and change in the Philippine political and policy environment. Again, good morning and welcome to our virtual town hall discussion. Thank you, Professor Manhit. Thank you for uh, setting the foundation for today's discussion. Uh, at this point, please allow me to introduce our first uh, panelist for this morning's program. Here to discuss foreign policy, with us to discuss foreign policy, security, and the West Philippine Sea, uh, we have Ambassador Albert Del Rosario. Ambassador Albert Del Rosario is a chairperson of Stratface ADR Institute. He is also the former Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines from 2011 to 2016, and was the Philippine Ambassador to the United States of America from 2001 to 2006. Uh, Secretary Albert, the, the floor is yours. Good morning, Bob. Uh, good morning, good morning, Paco. Uh, Professor Dindo Manhit, President of Stratbase ADR Institute, Excellencies and members of the Diplomatic Corps, my esteemed colleagues in the cabinet of former President Benigno Aquino III, Secretary Babe Singson, Secretary Manias Guerra, Secretary Butch Abad, Secretary Rene Almendras, and Secretary Ging Delas. Our friends in media, distinguished guests, Dr. Francisco Magno and Paco Pangalangan, our moderators, ladies and gentlemen. We contend that one of President Benigno Aquino's third Third's greatest legacies to the nation is the award on the South China Sea arbitration rendered on July 12, 2016 by the tribunal constituted under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. There are those who think the rule of law in international relations does not apply to great powers. 
President Aquino rejected that view. International law, he maintained, is the great equalizer among states as it allows small countries to stand on an equal footing with more powerful states. President Aquino believed that those who think might makes right have it backwards. It is exactly the opposite in that right makes might. We pursued a rules-based approach in our dispute with China in the South China Sea, which had three tracks, political, diplomatic, and legal. The arbitration case was our last resort, given that the political and diplomatic tracks failed to convince China to respect our country's rights and for China to comply with its obligations under international law. Securing the award had been the centerpiece of foreign policy during President Aquino's administration, and the award will continue to be a centerpiece of Philippine foreign and security policy for the next administrations. The South China Sea dispute is an intergenerational challenge that will affect the lives of Filipinos and our Southeast Asian neighbors for decades to come. Given the 10 months left in the Duterte administration, President Rodrigo Duterte, on the other hand, will leave a shameful legacy of squandering the award in a misguided quid pro quo for Chinese loans and investments, which have barely materialized to this day. In securing the award, if securing the award, became the centerpiece of foreign policy of the Aquino administration. The award is the hallmark of shame for the Duterte administration, given President Duterte's efforts to undermine it since the start of his term to the prejudice of his countrymen. You recall that when the president, when the award was rendered in 2016 at the start of President Duterte's term, there was already an order for Malacanang downplay the award for fear of displeasing China. You can see in retrospect how this event portended a treasonous policy of the Duterte administration of setting aside the award. President Duterte has chosen China over Filipinos because he believes Chinese President Xi Jinping is protecting his presidency in the Philippines. This national treachery would require serious evidence were it not for President Duterte's own admission in 2018 that he loves Xi Jinping and his public declaration of Xi Jinping's promise that Xi Jinping will not allow President Duterte to be taken out of office. Thus, it is the incumbent upon us, it is incumbent upon us Filipinos to protect what is ours for the sake of our children country. In this coming 2022 elections, we must vote for leaders who will put Filipinos first before China, money, and power. At this point, however, what must be done is clear. Given the limited time I have in this forum, let me mention three points. First is adherence to the rule of law. The award is the product of UNCLOS and international law. The award must be consistently raised before the United Nations General Assembly every year and whenever we can in other international fora. This is when we rely on the UN and other international institutions to serve not only as the primary promoter of the rule of law, but also the court, the court of the world public opinion. Second is our security. The award defined what is ours and what is part of the world commons should protect what is ours in the West Philippine Sea by relying on the skill, courage, and patriotism of our Navy and armed forces, which are capable of developing a credible minimum defense posture against China or any, or any bully or aggressor. Moreover, we must conduct joint patrols and join the freedom of navigation exercises of nations like the US, UK, Germany, France, Japan, and Australia in the South China Sea 
that are open to the world and does not solely belong to China. Third is the environment. The award found that China is responsible for having inflicted the most massive, near permanent and devastating destruction of the marine wealth in the South China Sea through the building of its artificial islands and military installations. We must make China accountable for this atrocity inflicted on humanity. The University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute conservatively, conservatively estimated that our country is losing at least 33.1 billion annually from our damaged reef ecosystems due to China's reclamation activities and illegal fishing operations. This sums up to 264 billion pesos since the start of 2014, around the time China started dredging until the end of this year. This money may be used to save our fish and rehabilitate the marine ecosystem destroyed by China in our waters. Having said these, please allow us to say that we are forever grateful to President Aquino for making the principled and courageous decision to sue China before an international tribunal to defend the rights of his countrymen under international law. As Secretary of Foreign Affairs during that time, I was given the privilege of implementing such a decision to sue China before an international tribunal. And now that we have secured the award, we are faced with the immense challenge of enforcing the award through means which include the three points I've mentioned. As a nation, we should regain our ground in protecting the West Philippine Sea. As we go into the 2022 elections, we should be discerning in our choice of leaders who have genuine love for our country. Conversely, the Filipino people should reject candidates whose motives are corrupt and are running for purposes of self aggrandizement Former Ombudswoman Conchita Carpio Morales is fond of quoting Cicero to deliver this message. Please allow me to read you this quote attributed by Taylor Cladwell to Cicero because it resonates within us under the present circumstances. Allow me. A nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. For the traitor appears not a traitor. He speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown in the night to determine the pillars of a city, to undermine the pillars of a city. He infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to be feared. And so, to all Filipinos everywhere, let us be vigilant against traitors in our midst. We know who you are and whom you have embraced with your undying love to the detriment of our country's patrimony. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your most kind attention. Thank you, Secretary Albert, for, for sharing your insights on an issue that continues to be very close to the, to the heart of, of Filipinos, the, the West Philippine Sea. Uh, and can, thank you for continuing to hold up the banner for the Philippines' arbitral victory. Uh, with that, uh, please let, allow me to introduce our next panelist for, for today. Our next panelist is Secretary Rogelio Babe Simpson, uh, who's here to discuss the lasting infrastructure projects of the Aquino administration. Secretary Simpson served as Secretary of the Department of Public Works and Highways from 2010 to 2016. Uh, he is also an industrial engineer and has worked in various leadership positions in government and the private sector uh, prior and after his appointment uh, to the Aquino cabinet. Uh, Secretary Babe Simpson, uh, good morning, Pop. The, the floor is yours. Hmm. 
Let's see. Uh, Secretary Bage, your your microphone now is on mute. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now, Papo? Yeah. I can hear you. I'm clear. Thank you so much. Uh, again, let me greet uh, my co-panelists and former colleagues in the cabinet. Uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I was asked to discuss the lasting uh, major infrastructure programs of the Aquino administration, but I'd like to cover as well uh, lasting policies and programs that we actually implemented during the Aquino administration. So can I have the first slide, please? So this shows us uh, how we developed the infrastructure budget over the period. I suppose Secretary Butch will give more details on this one. But as you can see, <clears throat> when we started in 2011, we're practically scraping the barrel. And we just started with 146 billion for infrastructure for the whole government, which accounted only for 1.8% of our GDP. But by the time we left in 2016, we we're able to ramp this up to as much as 5% of GDP. And the budget for infrastructure was already at 759 billion pesos. All told during the six years, we spent 2.4 trillion pesos. Uh, however, this I understand this pales poorly with about three times of the current administration's infrastructure budget. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide just shows you what we've done in terms of improving the quality and paving our national roads. I keep saying this, when we started, uh, we saw in our national roads what we call gaps, because depending on who was the sitting politician, if you were not a, you were not a, uh, within the same party, you get zero budget, and therefore, uh, our national road was really broken up into uh, political dynasties or political areas. We even had a lot of uh, wooden bridges on our national road network. So what we did was really upgrade our Philippine national road into higher standards and safer roads. By the time we, we, we as of December 31, we already had paved almost 100% of all primary national roads, 90% uh, of secondary roads and uh, tertiary at 80%. In terms of bridges, we had already fixed all of the bridges, uh, and I will show many of them, at least the key ones, uh, a bit later. We had already made permanent all the wooden bridges that we had uh, inherited in 2010. Next slide, please. By the way, what I'm showing you is what uh, we have submitted as our end term report, and this is uh, not uh, a recent uh, document. This is on record submitted to the Office of the President uh, as our end term report for DPWH. So what were the major strategic policies that we adopted? Number one was good governance reform and anti-corruption program. And here, let me explain this a little bit. Uh, we had to adopt the management mantra for DPWH as part of our good governance reform and anti-corruption program. We adopted what I had presented to President Aquino, initially three R's, right project, right cost, right quality. But President Aquino, as usual, because of his meticulous uh, review of the budget, added two more R's. He said, make sure that it is delivered on time and it is done by the right people. So now, we ended up with our five R's as our management mantra for DPWH, and that's the right project, right cost, right quality, right on time, and implemented by the right people. What does this mean? When we say right projects, are the projects going to be beneficial to the community and contribute to the country's economic development? We did not implement projects that only benefited a few or based on the whims of politicians in the area, okay? So we had to choose the right projects. Right cost means 
we conducted transparent and competitive bidding. And by December 2015, we had already saved 55 billion pesos of government resources simply because of transparent and competitive bidding. Right quality means we adopted very strict compliance to upgraded road standards. I will show you the pictures of the new standards that we adopted in terms of thickness, in terms of width and so on. So uh, the fourth is uh, right on time. We had to make sure that contractors really complete their projects as scheduled. If they want to continue as accredited contractors, they have to finish their projects on time. Otherwise we blacklist them or delist them from accreditation. Finally, the right people. Because of the support of President Aquino and of course Secretary Abad, we were able to hire 1,500 registered uh, civil engineers nationwide, which we deployed nationwide. So, so that we were able to change the complexity of our personnel in DPWH. Next slide, please. So, one of our major programs was what we referred to as our strategic convergence program. Here, together with the Department of Tourism under Secretary Jimenez, we were able to construct 2,500 kilometers of roads leading to designated tourism destinations. With the DOTR, we were able to provide national road standards accessing major airports, seaports, and rural ports. We had farm to market roads uh, with the Department of Agriculture. And of course, our major program with the DepEd was the school building program. I'll give you more details about that. And under our public private partnership program, we developed the high standard highway master plan for Metro Manila and 200 kilometer radius from NCR, which means all the way to the north to Tarlac and all the way, all the way to the south leading to Batangas and to uh, Quezon province, we had already established the high standard highway to connect and to disperse people from Metro Manila. We also had some re uh, resiliency programs that upgraded the standards for construction. We upgraded our design for school buildings to be able to handle 250 kilometer wind pressure. Next slide, please. So these are some of the uh, improvements that we made, uh, 18,000 uh, plus kilometers of national roads. And uh, these are regardless of political affiliations. We just had to work on national roads and national bridges. Next slide, please. So these are additional roads. As you can see, they are much wider, they are safer. Uh, national roads uh, that we constructed. Next slide, please. Can we have the next slide, please? As I mentioned, when we started in 2010, we had a lot of uh, wooden bridges. These are the bridges that we, we did, uh, fully concrete, permanent, end-to-end. Uh, Agusan, Isabela, we even upgraded the Ayala Bridge uh, without destroying this historic Ayala Bridge. Next slide, please. We had done 12,000 plus of flood control projects. And uh, as you can see, we did a river dike all war, uh, to avoid or to reduce flooding in uh, Navotas all the way to Ubando, Bulacan. We had small water impounding projects for irrigation as well. Next slide, please. Legaspi benefited from a river channel improvement that uh, reduced flooding in the city of Legaspi. And a major program that we developed was the master plan for flood control in Metro Manila and surrounding areas. Uh, here, we're very proud that we were able to do a river wall across uh, from Manila Bay all the way to Marikina. 
and this has reduced substantially the flooding in low-lying areas along the Pasig Marikina River. These are some of the major projects. Uh, and we, I'm happy to say that uh, Secretary Mark continued a lot of these projects because otherwise uh, we would have uh, continuous flooding in many of the low-lying areas because this is a long-term project. Next slide, please. These are the tourism roads, total of uh, 1,500, but by the time we left in 2016, it has been uh, increased 2,500. If you go to Butanding, for example, in Sorsogon, you have very nice roads uh, leading to those areas around Panglao Island, all the way from Puerto Princesa to the underground river. We inherited a road leading to a heritage area underground river that was made of local standards. And therefore you could not even allow tourist bus side by side. So I, uh, we had to develop that access road to Puerto Princesa and it is shown here that tourists and buses could go all the way very near to the underground river. Next slide, please. So these are additional uh, tourism roads leading to Mount Pulag, the Panglao Island. We even did uh, the Samal Garden, uh, C uh, Samal uh, Circumferential Road in Davao del Norte and uh, uh, leading to the Banawi Rice Terraces. Uh, before you could not access these uh, tourism destinations, you would struggle going to these places. Next slide, please. And of course, to, to take care of the backlog that we inherited, which uh, we, together with Brother Armin, I was assigned, DPWH was assigned by President Aquino to do the school buildings, instead of DepEd doing the school buildings, which were being implemented by school superintendents. And I said, my God, how do you expect school superintendents to be able to contract and uh, design or even uh, monitor construction school buildings. So we took uh, on under the direction of President Aquino and with this full support of Secretary Armin, we were able to develop and construct 34,000 classrooms under the DepEd uh, budget and some 1,138 classrooms under PAGCOR Silid Ar Aralan project. Next slide, please. Another major item or program that we developed was, as I mentioned, the high standard highway. Uh, many of these are still ongoing, but uh, as you can see, uh, Naia Expressway, the Tarlac Pangasinan La Union Expressway, and Lex uh, Harbor Link, Skyway 3, uh, which uh, recently opened uh, the Laridel Bypass, the Cabanatu and Tarlac, so all of these are, have been there. It was, it's a matter of executing them. And as I said, I'm happy that Secretary Mark continued many of these projects and he continued to benefit from inaugurating many of these as well. Next slide. Okay. Can we have the next slide please? I'm sorry, I didn't have the benefit of being able to move this. These are some of the high standard highways uh, uh, that we developed. Another uh, major program was the program to develop the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao. We did 33 billion pesos worth of projects. And these are some of the projects that connected what were already isolated places in the past, like the Basilan Circumferential Road, access to Tawi-Tawi main island and so on. Next slide. I'm sorry, I have to rush all of this because uh, we're given a 10 minute slot. Uh, this just indicates how we use our budget. 31% went to Mindanao, as you can see that was a much bigger budget than 
what in the past kept happening that NCR would get the bulk of the budget. NCR only got 7% of our budget. Highest was Mindanao, followed by Northern Luzon, and uh, followed by uh, 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 the Visayas area. Next slide. I think I have my, going into my final slide. A major project that we did for Mindanao was the Mindanao Logistics Infrastructure Network. When we started in 29, many of the road alignments were all north-south north alignment. We seldom had east-west alignments. So we had to open a lot of east-west. All these red lines that you see crisscrossing the whole of Mindanao led to the major ports of Cagayan de Oro, Nasipit, uh, Sasa Port in Davao, and General Santos. So what we did was connect the ports, airports, to the major production centers in the whole of Mindanao. So to me, this was a major development that we consider a major legacy of the Aquino administration. So ladies and gentlemen, I will end there and thank you so much for your attention. As you can see, we had legacy policies, programs, and infrastructure to live behind. Thank you for your kind attention. Yes, thank you, Secretary Singson. Yeah, I, I believe nga po, I remember reading that, uh, I think it was an official gazette, that at the end of uh, President Aquino's term, there were a total of 50 infrastructure projects that were approved, but were completed uh, after, after his, your and his term. So That's thank you very much for that. We're reaping the benefits of those infrastructure projects today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, next up po, uh, we have... Um, Secretary Manny Esguera, uh, who will be talking to us about economic policy reforms and the Philippine economy's acceleration during the Aquino administration. Uh, Dr. Manny Esguera is the former Director General of the National Economic and Development Authority. Uh, prior to his appointment as NEDA Chief, he was the Deputy Director General of the agency and led the National Development Office for Policy and Planning. Uh, Secretary Esguera, uh, good morning, Bob. I understand you'll be sharing your your slides. Yes, good morning. Uh, hey. I'll be doing that now. Can you see the slide now? We can. Yes, Paul. Okay, uh, good morning uh, uh, to the organizers of this uh, forum and uh, to my uh, <coughs> former colleagues in the, in the penal government. Uh, I've been asked to discuss about the economic policy reforms and Philippine economy's acceleration during the Aquino administration. And in what follows, given the limited time, what I'll do is describe the acceleration, uh, discuss what I think is its most important impact, and uh, finally try to explain what brought it about. I'd like to start by quoting the very first statement of the current Philippine Development Plan, which recognizes the transformation of the Philippine economy during the previous administration from being the economic laggard in Asia, one of the region's best performers. To be sure that catching up process <coughs> started uh, much earlier, as pointed out in a number of studies, but it was not until 2010 that historically strong growth of about 6% per annum was registered, which prompted the question, is the Philippines no longer the East Asian exception? By the way, this book was released in 2018 and you may have differing opinions about, uh, about how to answer that question, on whether the Philippines is no longer the East Asian exception. 
Economic growth was sustained at 6.3% during the plan period, the highest ever achieved across presidential terms. Let me access the laser pointer. So it's the highest uh, uh, <coughs> achieved uh, across presidential terms or if we go by six year, uh, if we go by six year moving averages, uh, it's the highest since the 70s. Uh, what differentiates, however, the more recent performance from that of the 70s is the higher quality of growth, which was propelled by sound fundamentals and accompanied by structural changes rather than by being that rather than being debt driven. The next chart shows how the Philippine economy fared with respect to other uh, Asian economies in 2015. There were high expectations for the Philippines at the time as can be seen in the chart from the IMF World Economic uh, Outlook. In fact, the forecasted figures here uh, were exceeded. We know now that GDP actually grew faster at 6.9% in 2016 and 6.7% in 2017. Moreover, uh, this particular period marked a turning point in the Philippines growth experience one described by economists as a case of growth acceleration for which certain criteria need to be met. Uh, <clears throat> in the interest of time, uh, we'll probably skip that, but thus far, 2010 to 2017 is the only episode of growth acceleration in the country's post-war history. And obviously most of that was under Aquino III's watch. Other countries in our region have had to. The sources and uh, <coughs> drivers of growth also change. Though growth is still driven by consumption on the demand side and services on the supply side to GDP, the contributions of both investment to, on the demand side and industry on the supply side, <clears throat> GDP growth increased during the period. These are also shown in the uh, next two slides with more of the taller and orange colored bars for investment here and the taller blue bars uh, for industry during the years coinciding with Aquino III. Since time is limited, let me go directly to what I think are the more substantial gains made during that period as a result of the improvement in the macroeconomy. And here I draw from the recently released Philippine Human Development Report of 2020-2021. First, poverty fell by more than <coughs> Uh, it had in previous periods. Uh, the next chart shows that uh, it declined by 3.6 percentage points among individuals and 3.2 percentage points among families. That means about 1.8 million individuals or 470,000 families exited out of poverty as a result. And the decline happened in practically uh, all <coughs> uh, 16, uh, uh, practically all administrative regions in the country. Okay. You will see all those uh, uh, negative uh, numbers there showing declining magnitudes of uh, uh, the number of people who uh, who are under the poverty line. The good news is that 
that decline had continued through 2015, 2018 by an even bigger magnitude. Sustained growth at the rates mentioned above and low inflation contributed to the significant decline in poverty incidence between 2009 and 2015. The table from PHDR shows, again from the Philippine Human Development Report, shows that the average annual rise in purchasing power over each of the three-year periods for which FIES data are available, increase in real expenditures was the highest in the period 2012 to 2015. The faster pace and higher quality of growth also created more employment opportunities, <clears throat> as indicated by the declining unemployment and underemployment rates seen on this slide. But as the second panel of uh, this particular chart shows, Employment opportunities did not only increase, but the quality of jobs also improved, as indicated by the increasing share of wage and salary workers in total employment, which means that more of the employed are in jobs paying higher wages. A further indication of the higher quality and pro-poor character of growth under the Aquino you know, administration's watch is the faster growth of manufacturing than services during that period. Compared with services, manufacturing tends to employ more people and because it does not require high academic credentials, it favors low-income individuals. It also provides more wages, uh, stable employment, <coughs> and therefore higher incomes. By the way, manufacturing is about 70% of the industry sector, which we noted earlier to have taken the lead in, uh, or to have grown uh, much more rapidly during the period 2010 to 2016. Finally, the scaling up of the four Ps or the conditional cash transfer program in 2010 is also credited for the reduction in food poverty incidence. As a result of the four Ps, school enrollment rates increased, nutritional status of children younger than three years improved, and poor women increasingly utilized maternal and child care services. What made these gains possible? As a final point, I think it's the following. Fiscal soundness uh, in terms of a modest uh, national government deficit, declining debt to GDP, lower interest payments, total disbursements, and higher primary expenditure, all of which resulted from reforms in revenue administration and debt and expenditure management. These reforms allowed greater public spending on social services and infrastructure, which was just discussed by Secretary uh, <coughs> Dave Singson earlier. The second is the robust external position of the country at the time. Although uh, it was faced with very challenging, uh, an ex a very challenging external environment, uh, current account surplus was supported by remittances and the export of services, mainly from the IT BPO industry and tourism. Uh, also, uh, the declining external debt to G GDP and the healthy level of the gross international reserves uh, combined uh, to make that robust external position uh, possible. Uh, stable financial system is the third. Uh, we were enjoying favorable interest rates and uh, we had a sound banking system, low and stable inflation. And as a final point, high investor confidence. Uh, FDI or <clears throat> foreign direct investment rose from $2.1 billion in 2009 to about $5.7 billion in 2015. 
uh, and favorable, and this favorable in investment climate was due to reforms uh, to increase competitiveness, which uh, were evident in the improved glo global rankings in the uh, <clears throat> Global Competitiveness Index, the Economic Freedom Index, the uh, uh, Ease of Doing Business, and the Secretary is there. Uh, let's give Secretary let's get uh, a moment to. Looks like we're facing some technical technical challenges. Unfortunate, as I felt like we were really close to him wrapping up uh, his presentation. Hmm. Secretary Esquerra. Uh, okay. I'm just dribbling it a bit, hoping that uh, Secretary Esquerra can come back. But uh, I think his presentation, Secretary Esquerra's presentation was very clear about how the economic reforms made by the Aquino administration uh, contributed to the, the healthy state of the Philippine economy. And like he said, it was reflected in a lot of the, the global rankings, for example. He mentioned earlier the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness, Competitiveness Index. The Philippines improved from 85th in 2010 to 47th in 2015. So, and you can see this across all of the, the, the global indicators for, for economic, for economics and for trade that the Philippines really has, the, the Philippines really did improve um, across many of these indicators. Um, well, if, well, we think at this point, may I think we just, I, I think we thank uh, Secretary Esquera for, for his presentation and maybe when he gets back, we can ask him to, to share his uh, his final you know his final ideas, um, but I think it's it's also just fair that we move on to our next our next panelist. Our next panelist uh, is the former Secretary of Budget and Management, uh, Secretary Florencio Bochabad, who is here to discuss with us uh, this morning anti-corruption reforms, transparency, and accountability. In the you know administration, uh, Secretary Butch, as I said, is Secretary of the, of the DBM during the Aquino administration. He was also previously Education Secretary during the uh, Arroyo administration and Secretary for Agrarian Reform uh, during the Corazon Aquino administration. Secretary Butch, good morning, Bob. I sir, your microphone is on mute now, no? Is it okay? Yes, it works. We can hear you both. I was saying, I was telling you that's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning and uh, thank you to the uh, ADR Institute as well as the uh, Corey and Inoy Aquino Foundation for organizing uh, today's uh, webinar. I think it's a timely and uh, a fitting tribute to President Noynoy Aquino, who unfortunately, after his term, did not have enough opportunities to share his reflections on his successful term as uh, president of the country. I remember distinctly, right after he took his oath as the country's new president, he called us uh, cabinet secretaries to the office of the president. I don't think it was a formal uh, cabinet uh, a meeting, but we were all there, uh, of course, very excited to hear from him. And I think 
he he just had one uh, message which I think which I think was very important to him, and he said. Uh, you have zero-based budgeting in government. I don't think many of my colleagues understood what he meant. <laughs> but I, from, from my end, I knew that the message was clear. You know, do away with incremental, low priority, poorly designed, and leakage-prone projects and programs. I think it's his signal uh, how serious he was in pursuing transparency, accountability, and anti-corruption reforms in his uh, administration, as well as the critical role played that was going to be played by the budget as a vehicle to achieve those uh, objectives. By uh, vigorously pursuing governance reforms at the heart of which were transparency, accountability, and anti-corruption reforms. The Aquino administration made unprecedented gains in many areas of, of governance. And let me cite uh, a few. I think those efforts in the first three years of his administration, which were really the years that the state work was done for this. We, it created uh, fiscal spaces that allowed the government to make huge increases, dramatic increases in the budget allocations of key sectors and programs. Uh, earlier, Secretary Bates mentioned the almost 400% increase in the budget of in infrastructure under his term. The education sector, it had 225 billion in 2010. By the time that we left office, its budget was around 551 billion. So more than close to 150% increase, which allowed DepEd to close its uh, resource gaps in providing teachers, in providing classrooms, and providing textbooks. The conditional cash transfer program you know, was funded uh, when we came in and by about 10, 10 billion pesos, uh, was increased to 62.7 billion pesos or about more than 500%. You know, the World Bank told us that we, we not to do it because we, will not be able, we would not be able to do it, but it happened and increased the beneficiaries from 800,000 families to 6.4 million families and made the country CCT program, I think one of the four biggest programs in the world after Mexico and I think Bangladesh. In the area, for example, of uh, uh, health facilities provision, the budget increased from 4.5 billion to 26.9 billion, so almost 500% increase. And you can see this across the many agencies where you know, key social services and infrastructure development was necessary. And, and this was possible as Mani, Secretary Mani said, because we improve revenue collections. We tightened on revenue collections so that it reached about 16% the revenue effort as a percentage of GDP by the time we left. And of course, we achieved uh, an average of 6.2% uh, growth in the economy, in the GDP during that time. And I have to mention that we, we hit 6.2% 6 despite the fact that in 2011, because of the strict uh, intensive review of programs and projects, GDP, as the government slowed down, fell to about 3.6%. But the following year, we recovered and once again grew at 6.6%. You know? And we were able to do this without having to incur indebtedness. In fact, our, our debt as a 
percentage of GDP fell from about 52% to about 44% by the time we leave. And the debt service as a percentage of the budget also fell uh, by the time uh, that we, le we left. And we kept the deficit, we kept the deficit because of the president's instruction to, to, uh, to uh, spend within our means below 2% for those six years. So that's why, uh, the, the, as described by Secretary uh, Vani Isguerra, the economy was in pretty uh, good health. We also uh, achieved huge and dramatic investments in our performance in uh, global governance indices, as also was mentioned earlier, in the areas of transparency, in the areas of corruption perception, ease of doing business, competitiveness, and economic freedom. The Philippines impressed many countries because of the huge gains that we achieved. And we were, we were thankful for the support of the business community and the private and the civil society in helping us uh, track our performance in these uh, indices. In fact, these are the general standards that applies to all uh, uh, departments of government. There were also sector specific standards as in the case, for example, of infrastructure. We also perform well in the quality of infrastructure indices. In the case of uh, uh, the budget, the open budget initiative, the Philippines uh, ranked number one in Southeast Asia in both uh, transparency and participation during our time. And number five in the world in participation and number 21 in the world in transparency, which is a huge jump from where we were before that. Because of this, uh, uh, I think the, this was being observed by many, many countries and of course the credit rating agency so that for the first time in the history of the country, we were able to receive an investment grade rating in March of 2013, which, which was really a vote of confidence uh, in the country that it is a safe haven to make investments in. And, you know, I, I'd like to emphasize when, when President Aquino issued an executive order to define the key results areas in his, in his administration, he always reminded us that trust is key. Trust because we want to uh, restore the confidence of our people in government. Trust because we want to attract back the, uh, the uh, investing public back to investing in our, in our economy. When, when all of these uh, developments were happening, of course, we, draw that, we drew the attention of uh, President Barack Obama, who was at that time trying, trying to promote a, 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 a particular baby or project of his, open government partnership. And we were very honored to be personally invited by President Obama as one of eight convening uh, countries to put, to, to put together the Open Government Partnership, which was launched in September of 2011. I remember with pride, you know, after it was launched in New York with the participation of about 65 heads of state, the headline of the New York Times there was a big photo of President Barack Obama with his uh, arms on the shoulders of President Aquino walking down the stairway, coming from the launch of the program, which I think was uh, a, a clear demonstration of how much confidence President Obama had on President Aquino in so far as promoting this, uh, this movement. So as uh, Secretary uh, Asguerra said, we were able to move from being labeled as the sick man of Asia in 2010 to become a performing economy or in some calling us the darling of investors uh, by 2016. You might want to ask, how was this possible? 
given the short period of time. Of course, it wasn't easy. In fact, the first three years was a lot of hard work. But I think the number one critical factor was the leadership provided by a determined, knowledgeable, trustworthy, and decent president, as exemplified by President Noy Aquino. I think he knew very well what to do, and he also knew how much power he had to be able to do these things. Uh, and, and that's why uh, when, when he issued an executive order uh, setting forth the five key result areas of his administration, he placed number one as a key result area, governance reform, and made himself chairman, just to make the point that this is something that was important to him and, and to tell everybody that we should proceed along this direction. I think another important factor was we had a cabinet which was composed of experienced, dedicated, and very respectable people, as you've heard some, some of my colleagues there, uh, who, who worked not just, not just as a cabinet or individual secretaries, but who worked as clusters uh, in the five key results areas that, that, that the President Aquino defined, and who regularly met and who regularly saw the president and, and many times had, had the occasion to uh, engage with, because I was always there together with the Secretary of Finance, uh, invited by the president to, to meet with the, with the clusters. I think a third factor that helped uh, the administration was its openness to working with the civil society, private sector, the academe, and multilateral institutions and international NGOs in establishing, for example, goals which, which have measurable results in collaborating in the execution of those programs and in the exercise of uh, oversight to determine how well, how far we have gone. Another important factor was the willingness of the administration and the cabinet secretaries to be to, for our performance to be set against global governance standards, which is risky because you can be proved to be a failure, but as it turned out, it, it turned out very good. In fact, in, in the case of uh, the, the DBM, we had to present a country action plan to the open government partnership as a basis for evaluating the extent that we have progressed as an open government administration. Then finally, I, I think what, what helped a lot, what helped Public Works, what helped the SWDCCT program, what helped the Department of Agriculture was our openness to innovations and, and new technology uh, to, to improve the efficiency of our work. That's why we had the e-procurement and e-bidding for the first time uh, in, in government. Our CCT payments were being done not through cash, but through digital portals. Uh, uh, Babe Singson was monitoring where his uh, dredgers were going by installing GPS on them. So at any time of the day, he knows where they are. Uh, CCTV or its uh, similar technology was used for the monitoring of the construction of farm to market uh, roads. And so forth and so forth and so forth and so on. People's budget, open data, seal of good housekeeping, participatory audits, but, uh, budget partnership agreements, and of course, bottom-up budgeting. I think these things uh, put together contributed immensely to what was achieved during those six years in terms of promoting greater transparency, accountability, and uh, reducing significantly corruption in government. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dar uh, sorry. Thank you, Secretary Butchabat. Yeah, uh, indeed, po, I think, like you said, the Aquino administration really was marked by impressive economic growth with, you know, like you said, four credit rating upgrades and significant foreign direct investment increases. And of course, this was all aided by uh, his focus and your focus on transparency and good governance, because indeed, good governance is good economics. Um, at, 
Oh, uh, okay. So, Secretary Puchabad, thank you very much. We actually have for Secretary uh, Manny Esguera, we're glad that he was able to rejoin us after facing some technical difficulties uh, earlier on. So if it's okay with you, Secretary uh, Almendras, before I, I go introduce you, sure. we'll give uh, Secretary Esguera uh, a minute or two to, to summarize uh, his points. Secretary Manny, are you there, Pop? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah. Actually, I was just uh, summarizing uh, when uh, I got cut off, and uh, after the slides that you saw, I was asking the question: What made these gains possible? And I was saying, I think the following uh, made those gains possible. First of all, is the fiscal soundness which allowed greater public spending on social services. And it also allowed us to ramp up uh, investments in, uh, in infrastructure and in particular, the uh, conditional cash transfer. Uh, we were enjoying a robust external position. Uh, the current account was in surplus uh, in spite of the very challenging uh, external environment. But this was supported mainly by remittances and the export of services, mainly from the IT depot industry and tourism. We had a healthy level of uh, gross international reserves and declining external debt to GDP. The financial system was stable, uh, favorable interest rates, and uh, we had a sound uh, banking system, low and stable inflation. And finally, and I think most importantly, was the high investor confidence. Uh, when the FDI rose from about 2.1 billion in 2009 to 5.7 billion in 2015, uh, the uh, FDI found their way mainly to manufacturing, financial and insurance services, real estate, information and communication, and food and accommodation. The favorable investment climate uh, was generally due to reforms to increase productivity. And a testament to that was the improvement in the Philippines' global rankings in several, uh, 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 in the uh, Global Competitiveness Index, the Economic Freedom Index, Ease of Doing Business, and the uh, uh, Corruption Perception Index. Uh, so that's it. All right, thank you, Secretary Manny. We're glad that you were able to, to rejoin the discussion. Um, so with that, I'd like to move on to our next panelists for this morning's virtual town hall discussion. Uh, next up, we have Secretary Rene Almendras. Uh, Secretary Almendras will be discussing the Aquino administration's efforts in addressing poverty, the balancing act between the economic development cluster and the human development poverty reduction thrust cluster. Uh, Secretary Almendras was Cabinet Secretary of the Philippines from November 2012 to March 2016. He was also the Secretary of Energy from 2010 to 2012 and was a key driver in pushing for private-public partnership for infrastructure and development in the country. Uh, Secretary Almendras, good morning, Bob. Thank you, Paco. Good morning to everyone and thank you to ADR and to the Foundation for sponsoring this and to my very distinguished, honorable, brilliant and wonderful co-cabinet members of President Aquino, who I already miss so much. Thank you, and it's great to see all of you. My topic this morning, in 10 minutes, I'll try to finish it, is basically to give you a glimpse of, of how the thought processes of President Aquino was moving into running the government. About two or three days after he decided that he was going to run for president, uh, this was when he was coming back from us. Uh, Zamboanga after his retreat with sister um, Agnes. He asked the question of Pano pagnanalo tayo, what are we going to do? And he asked this of many people. I remember when the administration started, uh, we were referred to as the student council. And of course, the president was Secretary Butch Abad by seniority. No? And uh, Secretary Abad was a member of the student council of many schools. Uh, Contrary to people's notions, there was a very good plan. President Aquino had a very clear picture of what he wanted to do. 
as president of the Philippines. Um, walang mahirap kung walang korap was not just a campaign slogan. Uh, from day one, it was very made very clear if he was going to become president of the Philippines, he wanted to make a dent in people's lives. And as he said, I hope to leave a better situation than what I inherited. And we tried to, uh, through many, many sessions, put a few of his ideas together. Uh, if you remember, there was always this whiteboard na pag pinapasok na to the president's office, everybody knew, oops, this is going to be a serious discussion. Let me show you a chart which was on that whiteboard for many weeks, very early on in the administrations uh, when we moved into the administration. This basically explains, and I hope you can see it, why we said that the whole aspiration of addressing poverty of human development was primary. And in the beginning, the notion that President Aquino had, had addressed was, let's get people jobs, let's get them working, let's get them employed because employed people are better off than unemployed people. So it was about job generation and on everything on the left side is about getting the private sector to invest. How was that done? Uh, and, and Sekmani already showed you massive investments from the private sector. Number one, President Aquino said, it has to be an even playing field. That's it. Every businessman should feel nobody will be favored. And then there were priority industries identified. Uh, Sec Greg Domingo had a fantastic uh, development plan. Originally, it was supposed to be for key priority industries, naging five, naging seven, naging 10. Eventually, Dozens of uh, industry plans were prepared by uh, DTI. On the right side is basically where, it, where President Aquino said, no, but we have to invest in the Filipino so that he can be gainfully employed. And that was CCT, education, health, housing, and agriculture. Everything boils down. There was emphasis for rural employment because we wanted to decongest cities. We knew agriculture was going to be the key to making that happen. Anything you put on number two adds to the consumption capacity of the population. People employed have money, money spent, will also grow business. So this, this chart was a beginning chart. Mind you, uh, Sec Butch mentioned that there were five key areas of performance. That's why the cabinet was organized into clusters. And people were saying, how come uh, President Aquino's cabinet does not meet every week? Well, the whole cabinet maybe doesn't meet every week, but every cluster had at least one or two meetings a week and the president would attend some of those cluster meetings. Let me show you the next slide just to reinforce what Sec Butch already said. Uh, I prepared this report in 2013, mid going into 14. This was a mid uh, midterm report that, that we prepared. DSWD, an increase of 494.79% versus 2010 budget. DepEd, 90.42. DOH, 249. Housing, 424, etc. Why, why did all this happen? Mainly because we wanted to emphasize the fact that if you go back to the previous chart, we said we wanted to make sure people get educated everyone gets free education and quality education. K-12, we need classrooms. The government couldn't do it alone. We had to get private sector to help build it. In health, and a part of even a family who was marginally above the poverty line, all it takes is for one person to get sick and then they fall back below the poverty line. Therefore, Phil Health was, was funded, syntax, everything housing because everybody knew that once you have your own home, life becomes a lot better. Even when I was in the DOE, my original assignment in DOE was just to make sure that there will be no um, brownouts during the term of President Aquino. When I finished that in 2012, I was really looking forward to going back to the private sector. But there was a program we started, which was CTO electrification. And I remember the first few CTOs that we electrified I purposely visited these CTUs unannounced, mainly to check whether talaga bang ginawa ng contractor, did Nea really do what it promised to do? Uh, I remember Butch, we would flood Butch with reports on the number of households electrified. I was meeting with a teacher in a newly electrified school somewhere in Central Luzon. And she was telling me about the, the kids who came from this CTU that had electricity, were a lot smarter than the kids who came from a city that did not have electricity. 
So I said, paano nangyari yun? And then she explained to me, because the kids na walang kuryente, they couldn't study at night, they couldn't read a book, they, they had to do it in the dark. And it dawned on me that even electrification was going to be an anti-poverty tool. So that's when I had uh, I was brave enough to go to the president and to Sek Butchabad and say, I need a lot of money. We want to electrify 34,000 sitios all over the country. And it was a very long discussion, but eventually I, the president said, yes, let's do it. Because you realize that when you electrify a sitio, you are already addressing a poverty structure. And all across the pre President Aquino's administration, it was all about that. Every single program you can think of, whether it was in DTI or in health or in DSWD, we had to address the issue of poverty. Why was PPP an option? Because President Aquino decided we would be better off spending our money in social services rather than building all these other infrastructure projects, which clearly the private sector could do. And that is the basis for the massive push to try to get private sector to do infrastructure so that the money that we could we, we did not need to spend on that infra, we could spend on the social services. You saw CCT grew fourfold. Uh, why, why, why did we go? I remember this discussion on poverty. Once upon a time, poverty was re really just looked at as uh, poverty incidents or the percentage of poor people in a region, in a province, in a community. Uh, I'm sure the members of the HDPR, the Human Development Poverty Reduction Cluster, remembered we had two, three days meetings discussing we should also look at poverty magnitude, meaning the actual number of people that are poor in a place because your incidence might be low. For example, in Cebu, poverty incidence would be low. But if you look at magnitude, it's a big amount because the total number of people who, uh, at the denominator were, were a bigger number. And from there, we started drilling down into the causes of poverty. And one area was we, had, we started using maps. And if we overlay the poverty map with the agriculture map, it was clearly shown that the poor communities were in the areas which planted coconut. And so we dove in and started asking why were they poor? Because the value, I remember the value added analysis that we did that the farmer actually gains only 30% maximum of the total value of the coconut produce because the middlemen, not one, but four, were able to eat on that. As a matter of fact, the comprador of the copra made more money than the farmer and and the end user. So many programs were designed to work on that. The other poor areas were fishing, fishing communities. That's why we started building fish ports. Uh, Tech Babes mentioned that and ports and refrigeration facilities. So that the, the drive to address poverty was not about um, dreams or talks up there very macro, no. On the contrary, because of the Human Development Poverty Reduction, which was composed of very skilled, talented, and dedicated people, really dove in and said, okay, this is where we want to solve this. So literally, we knew what this, how do we make the economy of this province, of this island grow? What do they need? And then plans were made according to that. Sec Babe Singson had to build tourism roads. Why did he build tourism roads? Because there were communities that clearly said, we need to show uh, alternative employment opportunities and, and a good tourism sector would develop or would help. So I remember uh, Sec Babes and Sec Mon Jimenez had to have many, many meetings because some of the tourism roads you know, had to be justified properly and appropriately moving on. Just showing you some more of these charts, which unfortunately are not public because they were our materials. Uh, this will clearly show what some of those, we call them convergence programs, opportunities when one agency will be working with another agency to address human development or poverty reduction uh, in various places, in very specific areas and in among themselves. Uh, again, tourism was, uh, was a major development that we had to go through. My time is up. I simply want to end by saying, yeah, the student council was a student council, but this, this student council bothered to study, 
to learn the ropes. And mind you, we were not perfect. One of my jobs was to submit to President Aquino, and some cabinet members knows these, as an evaluation of each of the agency's performance. My, they were not opinions. They were not subjected. They were data-driven reports. I remember um, the Office of the Cabinet Secretary would harass the DBM for the obligations report. Remember Sec Butch and the disbursement reports and all that? Because President Aquino would monitor that on a quarterly basis. Did this agency spend what it was supposed to do? Did this agency do what it was supposed to do? And then we were assigned to monitor programs. I had a team that was flying around all over the Philippines just to take pictures, just to monitor the progress of each of the projects. I remember the, uh, the school program. I remember Butch, President Aquino said, I want to know exactly where they were. So we actually geotagged every single one of those new classroom projects that were produced so that he could monitor and we could give him a regular report of the performance. Yes, President Aquino had a key result area defined in his administration, and he would review with cabinet members their commitments, their performance on a very regular basis. And, the, and this was all part of balancing the challenge of where do you put the money into economic development or into poverty development? No, we prepared a plan that said, wherever you put the money in, it always resulted in human development, poverty re reduction, economic development, and national development. Thank you very much and good morning to all. Yes, thank you, Secretary Almendras, for uh, that unique glimpse of, of that whiteboard and, and into that room where it happens, uh, you know, and also for painting a picture of the principled leadership, and the, the strategic and data-driven collaborative and long-term planning that went into running the Aquino administration. These are things that, of course, we hope to see from our country's current and future leaders as we continue to face this health and economic crisis. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, so next up, we have uh, our next panelist, uh, who is Secretary Teresita Ging Quintos Teles, uh, the former presidential advisor of the peace process. Uh, Secretary Dellis will be discussing the milestones of the peace process, the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro. Uh, Secretary Dellis is, um, as we all know, a peace advocate, feminist, and former presidential, presidential advisor uh, on the peace process. She, she was the lead convener of the National Anti-Poverty Commission as well, and received the End Peace Award as a role model for peace in 2012. Secretary Dellis, good morning. Um, thank you. Uh, Paco, and magandang amaga ho sa lahat. Uh, my former colleagues in cabinet all know firsthand the depth of the president of President Aquino's engagement in the Bangsamoro peace process, which resulted in a comprehensive peace accord ending 17 years of protracted peace negotiations and four decades of vicious armed conflict in Southern Philippines, in the poorest areas of the Philippines. Its continuing impact, whether it is finally fully implemented or remains in some form of uncertain suspension or extension, will be felt not just in Muslim Mindanao, but nationally, with its final outcome gaining more urgency in the shadow of violent extremism as, as the shadow of violent extremism looms darker over the planet. Due to time constraints, we will focus this morning on the peace process between the government and the MILF. The reality, however, is that we had five peace tables. Aside from the MILF, there was another negotiating table with the armed communists or the CPP, NPA, NDF, while three other peace tables sought to complete the implementation of peace agreements that had been signed earlier under different presidencies the CPLA covering Calderieras, signed under President Cory, the RPA forces based in Western Visayas, completed under Estrada, and the MNLF with the original Tripoli agreement signed under Marcos and the final peace agreement under Ramos. Suffice it now to say that by the end of the Pinoy administration, only one peace table remained in serious contention, the one with the communist rebel forces. It would be good if at some future time, we could do the math and assess what it has meant to the nation, 
the lives saved and transformed, livelihoods created, fields planted and harvested, the children finally at play and in school as a collective result of the efforts on these different peace tracks. But that is a mission for another day. With regard to the Bangsamoro peace process, it started with the commitment of then presidential candidate, Noy Noy, listed as agenda item number 14 in the social contract with the Filipino people, issued when he filed his certificate of candidacy to, and I quote, seek a broadly supported just peace that will redress the decades of neglect of the Moro and other peoples of Mindanao. This would be expounded under chapter nine of the Philippine Development Plan for 2010 to 2016, as consisting of two tracks, with a negotiated political settlement of armed conflicts as track one, and a complementary track to address the causes of these armed conflicts. The plan recognized that an enduring peace would not be achieved solely at the negotiating table. It would also need to deliver development on the ground as well as an enabling policy environment. The Pamana program would become the vehicle to converge the development efforts of 15 national government agencies, LGUs and the private sector, targeting seven conflict zones throughout the country. While eight public reform, policy reform areas were identified, including among others, ending impunity and EJKs, the full implementation of IPRA, an affirmative action agenda for Muslim Filipinos and security sector reform. The complementary track constituted mostly of quiet, but always rigorous and persistent work in remote communities or executive offices. The achievements in track one would comprise the dramatic milestones covered by media, not just here, but also internationally. In succession from 2011 to 2015, the president's meeting with MILF chair, Murad in Narita, Japan, the signing of the framework agreement or FAB, the signing of the comprehensive agreement or CAB, the transmittal of the proposed Bangsamoro basic law to Congress, the launch of the Bangsamoro development plan, the ceremonial decommissioning of MILF weapons and combatants. These composed incremental steps carefully crafted and cautiously woven together, supported by a scaffolding of joint working groups, independent bodies and protocols. In pursuing track one, the GPH panel was guided by the, presidential, by the president's letter of instructions, which laid out four essential parameters for the negotiations namely the constitution, the lessons from the MNLF negotiations and the arm experience, government's ability to fully deliver on the commitments and inclusivity and sensitivity to public sentiment. Item number three in particular, consume the president's personal time and attention. To Pinoy, these agreements were not meant just to be signed. They are meant to be implemented with no shortcuts, no false promises, no one left out or left behind, no one disadvantaged. Thus, peace negotiations couldn't just be the job of the peace panel. Before anything was signed, the concerned agencies had to be brought on board. The viability of the proposed provision meticulously studied, conflicts between agencies and jurisdictions addressed and resolved, and the needed resources assured. While the agreements were signed by the GPH panel, the whole government led by the president also held the pen. In the remaining time, let me quickly speak about another set of milestones established by the Bangsamoro peace process, which have been well, well recognized by the international community. I will focus on three. First, in terms of security, the robust ceasefire mechanisms that had been built over many years successfully preventing a repeat of the widespread violent outbreaks in 2000, 2003, and 2008, even in the face of the Albarca and Mama Sapano tragedies. As for the post-conflict normalization plan outlined in the CAB Annex, the political, the, the political department of the UN would observe it to be the most comprehensive they had seen from peace processes worldwide. Second, in terms of development, there was the Sajahatra Bangsamoro Development Program, 
jointly implemented by government with the MILF as an immediate peace dividend following the signing of the FAB with oversight by the cabinet secretary. As well, the Bank Samoro Development Plan was launched with the support of the international donor community, of which our Malaysian third party facilitator would note that nowhere else had a, has a former rebel party participated in the crafting of an official development plan, even while still awaiting the completion of the political settlement. Third and last, women's leadership and participation in the Bangsamoro peace process, which has come to constitute the gold standard for the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. This remains unmatched in the world. Although sadly now, there are no women in the leadership of the government's peace office. Today, the Bangsamoro peace process again stands at a crossroads. While there is consensus that for various reasons, including the pandemic, the transition requirements in the for the establishment of the regular autonomous government have not been completed. The bill extending the Bangsamoro Transition Authority continues to languish in Congress, its outcome left for political politicians, for local politicians to decide. As well, the heart of carpet bomb Marawi remains in ruins four years after the siege, stroking new grievances, reopening wounds that were just beginning to see heal. The Bangsamoro peace process was not just Pinoy's political legacy, it was deeply personal, a product of his time, attention, his integrity and insight, even his dreams, and always his remarkable leadership. Strong enough to survive presidential inattention in the last five years, it now needs urgent tending to endure and bear the fruits of our people's dreams. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Secretary Deles. I think you said in an interview uh, quite recently, Bono, that we would not have the Pangsamoro that we have today if not for, for President Aquino. And, and indeed, I think today we discussed uh, with, our, with our panel, you know, the importance of principled leadership, good governance, as good economics and dignified foreign policy. And of course, uh, peace in Mindanao is also among the legacies that, that the Aquino administration has left for us. Um, at this point, well, I would just like to say that, you know, that was our thing to thank Secretary Dennis, of course, and say that um, that she was actually our, our last panelist. And, and, you know, personally, it was a pleasure and an honor to engage with, with such an impressive panel of speakers. Um, I would also like at this point to turn the program over to uh, Dr. Francisco Kiko Magno for the opening, uh, for the rather the open forum. Uh, Dr. Mag Magno is a trustee and program convener of the Strat-based ADR Institute and a senior fellow and, uh, and founding director of the, of the De La Salle Institute of Governance. He is a full professor, former chairperson of the political science department and former director of the social development research center of the De La Salle University in Manila. Uh, Dr. Magno. Thank you, uh, Paco. Uh, Moderator, thank you, Paco. Time introduction. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of time at this point, so uh, let me just pose uh, one question and each of our uh, former secretaries can answer uh, based on the, the uh, portfolio and the work that they did with the Aquino uh, administration. <coughs> the presentation of our individual uh, panel members you presented uh, the reforms that were initiated in your respective offices. But at the same time, there was a recognition that some of these reforms were continued. Uh, of, of course, uh, you, you met a lot of challenges in, uh, in pushing uh, for these reforms. So the first question is, how did you manage to, to overcome uh, the opposition to these reforms? And second, uh, what are the reforms that have been institutionalized? And third, what are the uh, reforms that have been continued? And, and the last is, of course, we we'll go back to the leadership and uh, that, that's the opening line of Professor Dean Dumanhit, the, 
the need for a principal leadership, uh, the ability to analyze data and to apply uh, systematic uh, systems and uh, use this for prioritization. So maybe we can start with the Secretary uh, Del Rosario. Of course, uh, in the case of our foreign policy, uh, the, the current administration did not take up the, uh, the, the victory of the Philippines. Uh, so uh, I think specifically how much damage was done in terms of the inability of the, of the current government to, to really uh, push uh, and move forward with respect to our victory. So can the next administration be able to recover from, from the past five years of, uh, of inaction uh, with respect to our, uh, the Philippine victory in the arbitral ruling? Uh, Secretary. Uh, please unmute uh, Secretary Del Rosario. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I uh, started to say that uh, there has been a significant consequence in terms of uh, the policy for the current administration uh, to uh, um, Shelf uh, the outcome, which uh, was very positive for the Philippines. Uh, I think the the outcome not only uh, benefited the, the Philippines but also uh, other countries uh, in terms of uh, defining the entitlements. Uh, I. I think that uh, we are ready to give up uh, on this uh, incumbent administration in terms of uh, their uh, their intention to, to be able to uh, move uh, positively move forward uh, the overwhelming victory that we had achieved. So we we must uh, look for a uh, a, a uh, um, an, an administration building up uh, a uh, a very good uh, ticket for preparing uh, uh, to do what is right. Capitalizing on the arbitrary. It has to be the next administration to do this. And uh, we, we, of course, uh, uh, are, are blessed uh, with uh, the signals that uh, the responsible nations, uh, the community of nations, are with us in terms of uh, trying to move forward. So we, we need to uh, work on uh, having a, uh, a change in terms of uh, our governance. So hopefully uh, that will happen. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Secretary Babes uh, Singson. In terms of the reforms, as I mentioned, uh, the, the programs that we instituted uh, made were continued. No? 
uh, there is no way that they can discontinue a flood control project. Otherwise, uh, you would have uh, gaps. You know? uh, and since we focus on national roads and national bridges, regardless of uh, who the sitting politicians were, you know? um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I just made it a point that you know, this national road has to be done regardless of who were the politicians in that area. So uh, in a sense, I was able to also rally NGOs, church organizations to help me defend those national road projects. No? So I'm happy that uh, many of the projects that we instituted or started uh, were being continued. And uh, as a matter of fact, we were able to adopt uh, new procurement uh, with the help of DBM, uh, we were able to come up with a new law that was specifically for civil works. Uh, and this included uh, some provisions for how to uh, reduce corruption in the right of way acquisition of government. You know, when we started, the biggest source of corruption and the easiest way of corruption was right of way. <laughs> Uh, so we were able to somehow plug uh, that major uh, source of corruption. So uh, we did uh, major reforms in the policy as well as in the program execution. Thank you, uh, Sec Babes. Uh, I remember there was even a Bantay Lansangan during your time. That's correct, with NGOs. Yes, uh, thank you, Sec Babes. Uh, now let's go to Sec. Mani, Mani Sigera. Uh, Sek Mani, you were showing uh, us some data that uh, some of our breakthrough uh, economic uh, growth objectives were accomplished during the Akin administration. And, and then you continue to show some data showing uh, those growth patterns being continued. Uh, is it a matter that uh, the current administration is also using the same uh, same policies started by your by the uh, Aquino administration. Asek Mani. Uh, my signal is not stable. Can you repeat the question? Uh, you you've shown uh, data and statistics indicating that. Uh, the Philippines uh, registered uh, breakthrough uh, economic growth rates during the Aquino administration. And, and then you continued to show uh, data in the early years of this current administration showing that the growth has been sustained. Is it because these uh, same macroeconomic policies are being continued by the current administration? Generally, uh, we can say uh, we can say yes, uh, but you can also attribute that to some momentum. For example, uh, the the uh, the fiscal position uh, should be there uh, because the uh, the outgoing administration left a very the government in a very healthy fiscal position, uh, also the, <clears throat> the monetary policy and uh, the other policies were, were in place. Uh, you know, revenues were, were quite uh, uh, healthy at the time. And uh, there was, uh, you know, a lot of room to, uh, to continue uh, with uh, the the uh, the growth uh, or the trajectory of growth that uh, that the previous administration left behind. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Sek Mani. Let's go to uh, Sek uh, Butch. Uh, so during the Aquino administration, there are there are many particip participatory mechanisms uh, that were introduced. Uh, 
So this is part of the governance reforms and part of the open government partnership. And the open government partnership is being continued uh, right now. So what, what do you think is the difference between uh, the previous uh, participatory mechanisms and the current ones? Asik Butch, please unmute yourself. Am I in? Okay. Yes. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, how those participatory processes are being uh, pursued uh, under this current administration. But uh, what I can say is uh, just getting feedback from uh, some of the CSO partners that uh, we were working with. There is really less uh, enthusiasm for uh, pursuing pursuing some of them, like for example, bottom-up budgeting uh, 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 programs, where uh, the local government units get involved in the budget process on the condition that they involve the communities and civil society groups operating in their uh, communities or in their local government units. That was really uh, non-negotiable in so far as we are concerned. I understand that while some form of BUB is still being with local government and much less with the uh, with the uh, civil society or the community organs in those localities, our objective really there is, uh, you know, one of the one of the problems of uh, a centralized bureaucratic uh, a national government is, you know, things happen very slow. Or, for example, the problem of uh, underspending, and so if there's a way that we can devolve those functions, if there's a way that we can empower. Uh, community so that they get involved in those functions. Then there is a possibility of accelerating project implementation. But from what I hear, from the feedback I hear, there is much less involvement of civil society organizations and much more uh, emphasis on relating with local government units. I have nothing against relating with local government units, but as, as we know, in our, in our patronage dominated culture. You know, you cannot avoid that culture from pervading, you know, the spirit of uh, all those projects. That's why we insisted always that the civil society groups must, must participate so that they can ensure that the empowerment of the communities happens as they participate in the budget uh, process. So I think the uh, the the dynamic uh, sometimes uh, uh, very activist engagement of civil society groups is not as pronounced today <coughs> than <coughs> during our time. I think uh, what's also significant about what you said earlier, uh, Secretary Butch, is the openness of the. Aquino administration to uh, present itself before the international community and be rated uh, in accordance with global standards. Yeah. So, yeah, what's the, you know, what's the big factor for this, for, for this drive to be open about these uh, international standards? You know, uh, uh, Kiko, he, he always emphasizes the trust is key. You, of course, first and foremost, restoring the trust of people in their government. But at the same time, restoring the trust of the international community and the investing public in you know, the intentions of government to promote real development. And I think, I think by doing that, by exposing ourselves which of course makes us vulnerable to 
they, 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 they saw how serious we are in pursuing, uh, in pursuing that. That's why I think uh, if, you, if you go over the discussions with the different credit rating agencies, go governance reforms figured prominently in the decision to grant for the first time a credit rating, uh, investment grade rating to the Philippines, as well as granting the Philippines very high, high marks in, in, in those uh, global governance indices that I mentioned, including you know, our participation in the Open Government Partnership, as well as our invitation to become a founding member in the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency. And, and those help drive the foreign direct investments into the Philippines. At one point in 2014, I think we were number four. If you go over the 2014 FDI magazine, in terms of the number of FDIs being attracted into the country. And I think the, the, that is really the result of the government trying its, its best working very hard to restore the uh, confidence of the investing community in the Philippine government and in the Philippine economy. Uh, thank you, uh, Sec Butch. Now let's go to uh, uh, Secretary Almendras. Uh, you started your uh, talk with uh, uh, citing the, the slogan, uh, kung walang, uh, walang, uh, walang mahirap kung walang corrupt. So, uh, Sec Butch uh, discussed the, the anti-corruption indices. So, uh, has this, has this, uh, this performance in terms of uh, corruption perception, uh, is this uh, significant uh, in carrying out uh, in pursuing the slogan uh, kung, uh, about uh, relating corruption and uh, poverty reduction? And uh, you, you said it very well in terms of uh, the framework that the government is using, an integrated uh, human development, uh, social and environmental framework. So the, the, the use of uh, systematic planning and the use of, uh, of, uh, of indices uh, that are international uh, in character. So how, how do this fit in all this uh, planning processes of the government. And I, I, I saw that uh, it's, it's a kind of a, a convergent strategy and uh, a whole of government approach. Uh, Sec, uh, Rene, please. Uh, Sorry, Rene. Let me answer by picking up from Sec Butch about trust. No? It was very critical. You know, the, when, we, when we came into the picture in 2010, you had an economy that was predominantly a consumption-led economy. And the basic question, and mind you, President Aquino was a very well-trained economist, which is a problem for most of us, including me, uh, said, you know, how do you grow an economy if you are already, if your consumption is very strong and it's lopsided toward consumption? So the key was, if you can increase investments, then the consumption benefits from it, then you turn the economy and the economy expands. And trust was the key to it. He said, we need to convince local businessmen and foreign investors that we are a good place to invest in. That's why it was very important that we were benchmarked to the rest of the, of the world. I mean, we couldn't simply say, if I remember correctly, he said, you know, international standard, uh, nothing less than international standard for the Filipino people. And, and that, that basically was, is in addition to what Sekbot said, no? Now going back to your to your to your question to me, yes, um, there was a very clear plan, and we were adjusting it as we were moving through. There were times when we would adjust and say, "Okay, Mohang," and I mind you, we were uh, we were humble enough to know, "Okay, this is not working. Uh, we need to do something about this." So we calibrated very early on. Um, when I was involuntarily moved to Malacanang, and Butch knows that, in 2012, I had to study what the previous governments were doing. Uh, your question about sustainability of the reform programs. So from the time of the Tita Cori's term, Sec Butch, uh, probably is familiar with this, 
Sikping the Hexu sector per cabinet assistant system, which uh, we studied. And eventually in the Ramos administration, they had their version of it. Even in the GMA administration, they had their version of it, which allowed cabinet members to focus on the big issues and allowed another person to work out the details because key to the Aquino administration was not just a cabinet member performing at his own area, but imagine the synergy and how big a movement it could be when several government agencies work together to achieve something. And I, I did give examples of that. No? So uh, the, the legacy issue is there that, you know, we were, we were humble enough to know we did not want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to learn from the previous administrations and uh, hopefully the future administrations will pick it up from there. The issue at hand was really, uh, yes, the present administration, I understand uh, the office of the cabinet secretary has been retained. A good number of my former team was still there doing the monitoring and the studying. Uh, the important thing though is bringing the, it's not just one factor, like I said, Dr. Magno, the way we worked was, uh, you know, involving the private sector, not just as investor, but as, but as gatekeepers, as auditors. Uh, the way Sec Babes did it, he got his all the engineers in the land had had a say on the specs of the roads and all that. So those were all things being brought together. And correctly said, it's uh, an openness to not just being transparent from a fiscal prudence or. Uh, fiduciary responsibility, but even in the execution of items that were done. So uh, the intention was set up structures that will hopefully be sustainable. Uh, uh, Doc Kiko, can I just add to what? Uh, yes, uh, second to what, uh, Yeah. No, I just want to point out, because this was adverted to by, uh, by uh, Sec Rene. President Aquino made it very clear to me and he would always emphasize this and remind me about it, that the national budget has to be focused on providing social services, local infrastructure, uh, uh, and the reduction of poverty. Just concentrate on that. And he said, strategic infrastructure programs like and, and investments, he said, will have to be supported by PPPs, by ODA, and by FDIs. And that's why that's the context when he said, that's why we have to be able to attract partnerships with the private sector and multilateral agencies so that we can support what cannot be supported by the, by the, by the, by the budget through PPPs, through ODA, and FDIs. Because if we cannot, he said, then we will not be able to grow the economy and generate jobs and employment that our people need. So I, I, I think that point raised earlier by, by Rene is very important because really that's where the budget was focused for six years. And that's why it was very important for us to be an attractive destination for uh, investments uh, both from uh, bilateral and multilateral partners and from uh, international agencies because we needed them to fund those strategic uh, concerns. Just, just to highlight that point. If, if I may add, uh, Dr. Magno, because I see yes. Sec Jing Deles, even on the social side, the trust and the reputation of the Republic allowed us to get foreign governments, foreign private sector to assist. And I remember uh, Sek Ging and uh, my favorite Sajahatra Bangsamoro project where we played uh, uh, blood, sweat and tears, but uh, I've never been to a, am I, I've never been to a rebel camp, but uh, during that time I went to so many of them. We were assisted by foreign governments, foreign institutions were giving us funds to really ad address the poverty situation in the Muslim Mindanao area, because that was key to the peace process. We had to prove to them that our intention to bring progress and to do the right thing for them was there. Remember, there was so much distrust and uh, animosity because 
I remember Sek Ging, diba? the first time we went there, people were saying, oh, ito na naman kayo. Bubulahin nyo kami that you're going to do this, you're going to make this, and you're going, eh, wala namang mangyayari, papipirmahin nyo kami, tapos wala din mangyayari. Imagine the kind of uh, uh, trust that had to be nurtured, to be developed and nurtured to bring it to a degree that eventually we were partnering with rebels in the delivery of social services, whether it was a, the madrasas, remember, seeking the, the schools for their children. When they saw that we were seriously concerned about the future of their children, that we were going to put up the institutions according to their cultural sensitivities that will help the insurer to ensure their children's future. Suddenly we were, at least we got, they, we earned their trust. The next program was, I remember the, the health card. Can you imagine, uh, I asked, an MI, I, I would ask an LM, MILF commander, can you make me a list of all your combatants so that I can give them health card? The first thing he said, what, what prevents you from going to Sek Butch, uh, no, not Sek Butch, to Sek Gasmin to give him a list of my combatants? Then, uh, then he will know who are my combatants. But mind you, we eventually got that list and they saw how serious we were. And he, here you saw the international community. Sek Ging was, you know, brilliant and you know, she just brought in so many governments uh, from all over the world who were willing to help because they, they trusted and they respected our initiatives. Thank you, Sek Rene. So that brings us to Sek Jing. Uh, so the value of partnerships in the peace process. And of course, uh, the, the role of, uh, of the Aquino administration in, uh, in pushing for the peace process, uh, the the creation of BARM. Of course, the law was passed during the current administration, but the, what, what's the importance of, of the role that you played in, the, in this peace table, especially BARM? Um, well, I, I had said once that um, BARM would not exist without um, Pinoy. He was that, that grand gesture of the meeting in Narita with uh, Murad was broke the distrust that was there uh, following uh, major, major uh, violent clashes in 2000 under, in, under ERAP, in 2003 under GMA, and again 2000, 2008, right after the MOA AD. Uh, so what, there was a high level of distrust and restoring the, res resuming the peace talks. Um, uh, had a rocky start, and it was his taking the risk to meet with. Um, Chair Murad, because as he said, uh, when we weren't finding a way how to, to avoid an impasse, when he said, maybe if I meet him, maybe if we are able to look at each other eye to eye, maybe then we can um, understand where each one is coming from. Maybe we can find a way. And that has been, as, as the MILF has said, that was the thing that after that, uh, there's still so many issues, so many times when you, it was so difficult to find solutions, but there was no more threat of leaving the table. We became, as uh, Mohager Iqbal would say, we stopped being adversaries on the table. We became common. Um, we became um, problem solvers, jointly looking for solutions. And that, um, that has been um, where it is. Um, let, let me say that, yes, um, in terms of continuity, yes, the law was passed, but inexplicably slow for, uh, and I say inexplicably for the pre first president from Mindanao and who was someone who has claimed Maranao blood that it took two years uh, before the law was actually passed. And only in January, 2019 was the plebiscite um, passed, which meant when the, when the pandemic uh, happened, there was really very little time. And because very little real handholding of looking at the most difficult, the most difficult provisions, the intergovernmental relations, the security aspect, uh, how to really um, provide the fiscal autonomy of an autonomous um, region uh, that had not been really looked at and, and being taken care of. Uh, plus Marawi happening, uh, uh, be, uh, opening, uh, beginning a new layer of what will be referred to as historical injustice uh, and a new generation of Moros with a very, 
deep sense of grievance, uh, it is important to really get it back on track sincerely by the leader, the, the highest from the highest office to pay the peace process very serious attention because the because the consequences of of non completing is uh, difficult to imagine the commissioning has not been finished the weapons are still out there uh, with the violent extremism rearing over it said over and over again uh, where it will go as one young MILF um, partisan had told me early on sec if we don't succeed um, we will break into 100 armed bands and even I will not be able to stay in Mindanao. Uh, people take the peace process for granted when there are no big wars. But it needs patient, attentive uh, tending to keep the wars away and to ensure that what was promised gets done because that is what will birth um, the dreams that had pushed the struggle in the first place. And in the end also pushed uh, the peace process to, to peace agreement to completion. Uh, thank you, Sek Jing. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. So uh, let me just read the questions from our participants. Uh, so uh, each of the panel members, I'll ask you to address maybe the specific question uh, uh, asked by the audience in uh, and the, the final words. So the, here's one question. President Pinoy's accomplishments are being claimed by the Duterte administ administration as their accomplishments. What can you say about it? From Maria Cecilia Basconcilio, True, the classroom backlog was addressed during the Aquino administration, but some school buildings that were built were substandard and the buildings, especially for the senior high school, the buildings that were constructed were not designed according to the courses that were offered by the school. I think something should be done to address these concerns. So I suppose this is for sec waves. Uh, Questions addressed to the former cabinet members. Uh, puro mga ex-military din po ba ang members ng IATF? I suppose this is a question when IATF was uh, created during the Aquino uh, period. Uh, so Norris, uh, Dr. Norris Falguera is asking that question. Uh, Andrew Masigan, from Andrew Masigan to Secretary Esguera, at the heart of the robust manufacturing growth during the Aquino administration was the formulation of some 84 industry roadmaps. How would you assess the manufacturing development program of the current administration? Are industry roadmaps being updated and adhered to? So to again from Norris Falguera, question to Secretary Abad, why did you exert effort to shift to line item budgeting since you've seen you have seen madaling mag magic sa budget given lump, lump sum budgeting? From Dr. Mario Aguha, in the past, the absorptive capacity of government agencies was already problematic. The study of Toby Monsod pegged it at 85%. Given the increase of funds for COVID response, government downloaded huge amounts of money to different frontline agencies. It is a mess. How do we ensure that government agencies can absorb needed funds? If none, what should be the option to to disperse these badly needed funds to the public. From Mike Navalio, given how the Pinoy administration performed, how do you think it could have addressed the coronavirus pandemic better? So, uh, so I, I think th those are the questions. Uh, I, I just read them from the chat box. So uh, maybe we can start with uh, Sek Jing. 
So this is also your final uh, point to give uh, maybe uh, a final uh, remark regarding the legacy of the Aquino administration. Yes, um, the, no specific question was raised about the peace process. So maybe I'll just respond to the first one, uh, which is about the um, credit grabbing. I think I think more important, more more serious than that is that for the policy to be continued. I think I think the attribution um, is something that one might feel um, sentimental about, but that that was never really what mattered to us. It was never really about us. It was it was about what doing what was right. And if 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 um, if if they continued to do what was right, I I I don't. Think anyone would mind uh, um, sharing the credit? Uh, the important thing was to continue to do the right thing, and that is where we are immensely, immensely um, disappointed, angry uh, that so much of good governance has been um, squandered and um, distorted and just plain done away with. Um, I think if they did good governance, I'd give them, I'd give them, I'd give them all the credit. <laughs> I'd give them all the credit. What's important is to have done the right thing. Uh, thank you, Secretary Jingdeles. Uh, Secretary Rene Almendras, your final words. I'll, I'll address two points. The one, the question about why manufacturing was a priority and the, all those eighty-four plans. The answer to that is because. Remember the target was job generation and we were trying to identify the industries that would generate the most number of jobs because with a, with a, with a huge population of unemployed and uh, continually uh, adding to the workforce, you need to jo create jobs. So we needed to drive uh, job generation in choosing the right sectors, the right businesses that would have the highest uh, job generation potential and manufacturing was one of them. The Philippines is very skilled at that. The second item I want to address is absorption. Yes, uh, there was a study that was that said absorption capacity was about 85. I will say that during the Aquino administration, I would prepare a quarterly report to the president on each of the agency's absorption. And on a few and several years, especially uh, after the first two years, there were agencies that were doing close to 100% of their allocation. I will mention one that did it, but I won't mention those that did not. Yes, we were not perfect. There were agencies that were as slow as 45, 50% only. Uh, Sec Babe Singson, my very good friend there, is one of those whose absorption was close to 100% um, on, on, on a year's time. No, uh, I always referred to him as the big spender. So, but... Yes, a study would show 85%. It is a problem, but it is not an impossible problem. Uh, right leadership, right structures, right process uh, will create better absorption and better execution capacity. Uh, the other, com the other, other comment I think is about, all I can say is that if the, UP if the cabinet members remember, there was this incident with the SARS coronavirus, the Middle East version, and uh, we did contract tracing, many sleepless nights. And what I remember very distinctly was that was happening on a holy week. And my family and I were supposed to be going somewhere for a, for a, for a holy week break. Uh, when I, I had to let my family go ahead because the president and I were attending to this, uh, to this crisis. And when I was in the car on the way to follow my family, um, my wife called me and said, Pinoy called me and I understand why you cannot come. So I, did, I didn't go. So then all I can say is we don't know how President Aquino would have addressed it. All I know is he would have tried his very best to do the right thing. Thank you to everyone and good morning. Thank you, Secretary Rene Almendras. Uh, Secretary Babe Singson. Prof Kiko, uh, two things. Uh, really the absorptive capacity. There were two indices that we were being closely monitored. One is absorptive capacity and the second is the disbursement uh, that was happening on a monthly and quarterly basis. Now, 
at this point, I cannot imagine how these current departments can fully execute their budgets. No? Ang lalaki. No? One, for example, a regional office with over 50 billion pesos in contracts. I cannot, pag samasamahin mo lahat ang AAA contractors sa Pilipinas, they will not be able to bill 50 billion pe pesos in one region. No? There is no way that we can expect uh, the, the agencies to be able to absorb anything higher than 50% because of the huge budget. And under this situation of ECQ, MECQ, lockdowns, it would be very difficult to execute uh, uh, projects or infrastructure projects that are so huge. Otherwise, it will just go to corruption. No? It, I would rather revert back the funds than just release the money for corruption purposes. That's my, that's my take on all of this issue of absorptive capacity. Thank you, uh, Secretary Babe Simpson. Uh, let's go to Secretary Buchabad for uh, final comments. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kiko. You know, we made certainly unprecedented and huge improvements in uh, governance by in introducing administrative technical, uh, political, uh, in which, you know, substantially changed uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, governance functions like in the economy or budgeting. But we realized towards the end that if we do want to sustain all those reforms, on top of that, we still have to address fundamental problems that are deeply rooted in our history, as well as, as, well as in the structure of wealth and power in, in the country. History because of the colonial legacy, which prevented you know, this country from developing as a nation or people to embrace nationhood. Structural in the sense of how, how wealth and power and are distributed in this country, which, you know, as we all know, fosters poverty, dependence, and a culture of patronage. So I think we, we knew that we did not have time to do that in those six years in government. And we knew that if, it, if you know, given another opportunity to continue, that would have been uh, a key priority in, in the next administration. But whoever it is that succeeds in 2022, we'll have to really confront that uh, deeply rooted fundamental contradictions in our society. If we are to graduate from you know, these changes to more lasting <clears throat> changes in our political culture and in our economic uh, 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 structure. So I think that, that, that has to be emphasized because while you know, unprecedented gains were made in those six years, they could easily reverse unless we deal with those deeply rooted problems. Thank you, uh, Secretary Buchabad. Uh, now, uh, Secretary Albert Del Rosario for your final uh, comments. Uh, sir, uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I, I want to uh, be as succinct as possible. And uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, to focus on uh, the important things which I thought were imparted by uh, President Aquino uh, to the people who worked with him. Uh, he was uh, very focused in terms of uh, you're doing what is right and uh, you're doing uh, what you need to do in the most professional way. I think uh, that, that's what uh, President Aquino was all about. And I'm so uh, to be able to work with him. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary. Albert Del Rosario, it, it has been a privilege for me to moderate this uh, wonderful panel of our 
former secretaries, uh, cabinet secretaries of uh, the Aquino administration. Uh, I just mentioned the, the eight key points uh, that I, I got from this uh, discussion. Uh, first is the importance of principled leadership. The second is that governance reforms work well for economic success. The importance of convergence programs for human capital development, social protection, and economic success, economic growth. The fourth is the use of key result areas, roadmaps, and systems analysis, and the uh, integration of data, data in uh, planning. The fifth is you go beyond political divisions, uh, claims for success, and uh, proceed with projects that you can preside over in its inauguration, and that applies to the uh, infrastructure projects uh, shared by SecBabes. Uh, you plan for projects, but uh, it's uh, for the long term. Not afraid to subject your platform or your performance to international standards. Seventh is the rule of law rather than persons. And finally, institutions outlast personalities. However, principled leadership is needed. And th this kind of leadership is important that looks back to build forward. So again, thank you very much to this uh, wonderful panel and I, I bring you back to uh, Paco. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Magna for moderating the, the, open, the open forum and the panelists for sharing your time with us this morning. On, on behalf of uh, Dr. Magna, our moderator and Professor Dean Damanhit and as of course, Secretary Alberto Rosario of the Stratways ADR Institute, I thank everybody for for your time this morning and to our participants as well uh, for share for you know for attending. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, I think thank I will you. officially close and let's Professor Manhit thank wants thank to you say so anything. much. Okay. No, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to all our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Yes. Yeah, so I'm uploading this on, on, on our Facebook channel and so and uh, YouTube. So yeah. Thank you everyone. All right, thank, thank you so much.